Hey guys, uh, when I did this video, um, somehow the beginning part of it got cut off. And uh, what I'm trying to do is talk about speaking the truth in love between the two groups of people that I think we generally are broken into. Now, I know there's some people that are a little more down the middle, but typically I think we're, we're broken into two groups, people that are a little more thick-skinned and people that are a little more thin-skinned. Thick-skinned and sensitive, um, maybe more direct and maybe a little more tactful. Right. And so I just wanted to talk through how to speak the truth in love between those two groups of people and kind of how to how to biblically handle it and look at some good biblical model in Jesus. So if you take a look at this video, I think it'll be helpful. Bottom line is, I hope that it finds you well. I hope that it encourages you. And more than anything, I hope that you love Jesus more when it's all said and done. God bless you guys. I hope you're having a wonderful weekend and um, stay safe out there. OK, so in Ephesians chapter four, Paul is talking about unity. Um, uh, in the spirit, unity in the church. And he talks about not being tossed to and fro by different waves of doctrine. And he says, rather speaking the truth in love, okay, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body jo is joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped when each part is working properly makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. So I'm using that as a framework to talk to you today because I want to talk to Christians. Now, if you're not a Christian and you're, you doubt or you don't believe or you've come to your own conclusion specifically and said, this is why I don't believe, that's fine, that's fair, that's acceptable. Um, but I would challenge you to send me a direct message. Send me a private message and I would be happy to talk with you and go through it. I think you'll find that if you'd examine the evidence, the evidence points to a creator, the evidence points to Jesus being savior and to being Lord of heaven and earth. And I think that after a conversation with me or with anybody who, who can walk you through this, if you would disagree, that's fine. You, you have your right to do that. But I would challenge you to do that. But for, for the believers now, today I'm talking to you who profess Christ, who have trusted in Jesus Christ as Lord and savior, who have been redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ poured out on the cross, who have been Changed, who've had a heart of stone taken out of their fleshly body and now given a heart of flesh. And now you're spiritually changed, transformed and renewed and have newness of life in Jesus. I'm talking to you Christians today about speaking the truth in love. Now, specifically, I believe this is gospel truth we're talking about here. But I think there's an implication for all truth to be spoken in love. And so I consider this passage in Ephesians chapter 4. I consider uh, the idea that when we speak to one another, it should be done with the mindset of change for the sake of the gospel. It should always be with the benefit going towards how do we further God's kingdom here on this earth, right? More than I want to be right and prove you wrong. And even if I am right, let's say what I'm saying is right and what you're saying is wrong. The goal should not be to just simply say, I'm right, you're wrong, I want to make you feel stupid but rather to help turn you away from maybe bad thinking, bad ideology, or even possibly sin, right? And so speaking the truth in love is to see, as it says, as I said before and I quoted earlier, it's to see us grow up in every way into, uh, into him, Jesus, who is the head. We wanna be like Christ. We want to be held together and joined together by Christ and his love and be bound together by faith in him and in him alone. And so when I say speak the truth in love, the idea is, yes, gospel truth. But then also, what other truths do we speak to one another or have conversations about? And we don't always speak in love. So what I want to challenge the believer to do is take the example of Jesus when it comes to speaking the truth in love. The first place I see this is for the thick-skinned people. You guys, you guys, and I say you guys, I think I'm more the thick-skinned one. I think I'm like one of the leaners towards thick-skinnedness, but I do have sensitivities as well. Thick-skinned folks. Let's look at the story of Lazarus when he died. When Lazarus dies, John chapter 11, Jesus is gone for two days. It takes him two days to get back. He, it's four days since Lazarus has died, okay? Purpose behind that is, 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 is there's more to it. I can talk about that another time. But four days have passed, that man's dead in the grave, he's wrapped up in his in his, in his his dead clothes, you know, his grave clothes, gone, okay? He's dead, heart ain't working, brain ain't working, lungs stop working, um, 
diagnosis COVID-19. Just kidding. Just kidding. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I, as I had to. It's too funny anyway. But Lazarus is dead. Two sisters, Mary and Martha. And if you remember the two sisters, Martha was the was the, the, the micromanager. She was the one always working and always doing and, and pointing and saying, we need to do this, do that. She's the one who, while Jesus was preaching and Ma Mary is at the feet of Jesus, worshiping him, adoring him. She says, hey man, Jesus, she's gotta go. We got things to do around the house. We got too much to get done. She's over here trying to worship at your feet. We ain't got time for that. And Jesus looks at her and doesn't say, what you're doing is stupid. What you're doing is wrong. No, he, he says, Martha, She's, she's considered the better thing. The better thing, the greater thing is to be at my feet worshiping. And so the two of them, both sisters, come to Jesus when he gets to, to Lazarus. And they both say the same thing. Lord, if you would have been here, my brother wouldn't have died. Both of them say, both of them, Mary, Martha, say the same thing. One says this, one says this, the exact same thing. Jesus' response to the two of them is different. To Martha, he says, listen, girl, no, no, <laughs> he says, look, let's talk, okay? You, you're coming to me right now. Do you believe that he's gonna resurrect? And Martha says, yeah, in the end, in the end. Jesus says, you're talking about the resurrection to come. Let me clarify for you, honey. I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he dies, yet he lives. Now, anybody hearing that goes, what? Yeah, he's going to die. But he's still going to live. Because the life you have not only begins on this earth, but it will be forever and ever and ever. Amen. He says, I'm the resurrection and the life. He kind of rebukes her and corrects her. And he's firm with her. I don't think that he's, I don't think that he's being all tender and loving. And Sometimes the truth comes out firm. He's being firm and he's saying, Martha, this is what it is. This is the facts. Consider the woman at the well in John chapter four. Jesus sits at the well, asks her for some water. She says, I'm a Samaritan and a woman. We shouldn't be talking. <clears throat> After a few more exchanges, he finally says, if you knew who I was, you would be asking me for living water. You'd be asking me for life everlasting water. You'd be asking me for eternal living water is what you'd be asking for. And she begins to press him and say, well, how do I get a hold of this water? How does this happen? And Jesus says, go get your husband. Now, if you know the story or if you don't, I'm telling you right now, this was a, this was a, this was a bit of a loaded statement. Okay. Like, you know, loaded questions or usually I know the answer to it, but I'm asking you to see if you're going to lie to me or do whatever. Jesus knew what he was doing when he said this. Remember, he knows all things, sees all things. And so Jesus says, hey, um, go get your husband. And the woman reveals, it's your first time hearing it. It's a moment of like, what the heck? And she goes, I don't have a husband. And Jesus says, you're right to say you don't have a husband. In fact, you've had five husbands. Dang. And we don't know the circumstances as to why she lost those five husbands, whether there was death involved at any point, or maybe she was a promiscuous woman, or maybe these men, uh, you know, were bad men. We don't know the, the whole situation in the story, but it's most likely he brought that up because maybe she had issues and that was so important to, to, to address, right? But at the end of the day, we don't really know. What we do know is that Jesus says, you've had five husbands, you've had five. And now you're with a man who's not your husband saying, look, the water you're drinking, the, the husbands you're marrying, the men you're seeking to fulfill your needs can't do it. Only I can. Only Christ can fulfill your greatest need. Your greatest need is, to, is love and acceptance and forgiveness of sins. That's the greatest need you have is, is, is love and acceptance of the Father, your forgiveness of your sins. And you don't have a way to do it apart from me. All these other things you're seeking aren't enough. And so... Jesus says these words, and I guarantee you this was not like a tender little, hey, sweetheart, I just want you to know. I'm pretty sure he was like, so go get your husband. I don't have a husband. You're right, you don't. You had five, though. Now, I don't think Jesus was being a jerk here. I don't think he was being sarcastic or being rude, but he was being firm. He was being matter of fact. He was saying, this is what I know of you, and I want you to know that you have a greater need than you understand, and you have a way for it to be fulfilled if you'd ask for living water from the one who can save your soul.
But he says, he says, look, you don't understand that right now what I'm telling you is hard truth. It's firm truth. But guess what? It's truth. So Jesus does this with Martha. This is a time to be firm. Like Martha, don't, don't come in here micromanaging me. I'm the Lord. Do you believe in resurrection? Martha says, well, I just, yeah, he's going to come back eventually. No, no, I'm talking about right now because I'm the resurrection of the life. He who believes in me, though he dies, he'll live. And then he goes and he sees Mary. Mary, same thing. Lord, if you would have been here, my brother would be alive. Now, I think the way that Martha approaches this is the micromanager type. The same way she jumped to Mary. Hey, if you were here, if you were here, this would have happened, God. And, God, and Jesus is like, slow your roll, lady. Just relax. And M Mary comes. I think Mary's more upset, more frustrated, more, more visibly affected by this. And Jesus' response to her is different than the one to Martha. Very different. He doesn't say anything to her. After she says it, he goes, he doesn't jump her case. He doesn't correct her. He doesn't come firm. He comes very tenderly and he says, where have you laid him? She sees her weeping. She, he, sees her, he sees her weeping. He sees the other people weeping. And this is where the shortest verse in the Bible shows up. John eleven thirty five 35 says, Jesus wept. Jesus was moved with compassion. He was filled with compassion because he loved these people. These were like family to him. These are people that he, he spent time with. He ate meals with. That's where the whole first part of the story I told you, where Mary and Martha, Mary's at the feet of Jesus. He's eating in their home. He's enjoying time with them. And he weeps for them. His heart is broken. There's a compassion for him. Now notice with Martha, he's firm, but then you move over to Mary and he's more tender. He's speaking the truth in love either way. With the woman at the well in John chapter four, he's speaking the truth in love, no matter what way you look at it. So for you people that are thick-skinned, notice the shifts and the differences. He goes to the woman at the well, he's kind of firm with her. He's like, hey, listen, you've been with five men and it's not working, is it? You know why? Because you're trying to fill yourself up with water that will never satisfy. If you drink this water, you'll live forever. Now, he goes to Martha. He says, Martha, chill out. Don't you believe in the resurrection? Yeah, I know one day. No, I'm telling you, I'm here now. And then he goes to Mary and sees her heartbrokenness and he says, Mary, you know I love you guys. You know I'm going to take care of you. Show me where he's at. And one of my favorite things is in the King James Version, when this whole story goes down, which is not even what I'm here talking about today. The way they put it, man, the first time I ever heard it preached this way was so cool. He, he says, open up, the, open up the tomb. He calls out to him. He comes out alive and in his grave clothes. And Jesus says, loose him and let him go. I'll never forget this Southern Baptist preacher. Loose him and let him go. And I was just like, woo, what a beautiful story of, of God's redemption saying, I'm the resurrection, I'm the life. You're going to see this man resurrect after four days, which by Hebrew understanding would have meant the soul would have been gone. The spirit would have left him already. There was no way he was coming back. Four days have gone by, but guess what? I got better news for you. Don't get caught up in what you know or what you think you know, because I am the one who can defy all reality. The reality is you are sinful from birth. But, the, but, but a greater truth, the perfect and absolute truth is, is that I can take that incapability you have, the incapability to be saved, and I can save you. Yeah, you're dead as a doornail, but guess what? I'll give you a heart of flesh, and now that heart starts a pumping, and you live in. I can do that. That's who I am. And so Jesus, look at how he talks to Mary, how he talks to Martha, and how he talks to the woman at the well. Thick-skinned people, you have to learn how to shift from just hard truth to tender, loving kindness at times. You've got to learn how to talk to people in a way that tells them, I care about you. One of my favorite illustrations I believe the Spirit of God gave me, now I didn't get like some revelation in the sky or I didn't hear a voice go blah, blah, blah. No, all I know is there was a moment where I was talking to somebody and they said, I don't believe what they believe. I don't agree with it, what they believe, talking about a certain subject matter. I said, but could it be that it could be that they need to be told it's not real, but in a way that's loving? For example, if your daughter came to you and your daughter was weeping, your daughter was upset and she says, the boogeyman's out to get me, the boogeyman's out to get me. You wouldn't go, girl, you dumb, no boogeyman coming out to get you. You would, as a loving father, grab her by the arm, pull her in and hug her so tight. You might even tear up with her and say, baby, I know you're scared, but I got two, two guarantees for you. Number one, there ain't no boogeyman. And number two, if there was, daddy got a gun, okay? Th there's no boogeyman. And you do it in a loving way. 
and you, you gently correct her and steer her. So thick skinned people, you gotta learn how to gently steer and correct people. And you sensitive folks. God loves you, you sensitive folks. But you gotta learn how to take things and understand sometimes the truth doesn't always come across delicate. Think about a child that's misbehaving. Maybe in the beginning it's, hey, stop that. Don't do that, you're gonna get hurt. Don't, don't, put, don't do that. But there comes a time when the little kid is running around acting a fool. He's like, hey man, hey, you want a butt whooping? You want to get some? That's not loving. No, it's absolutely loving. Because I don't want my kid to grow up to be a delinquent. I don't want my kid to grow up and think he can just do whatever he wants and get away with it. In fact, the Bible tells me that if I spare the, spare the rod, I'm spoiling the child. And I will not spare that rod. I will bring that thing and bang and bang and bang right on his backside because he deserves it and he needs to see it. And he needs to see that my tender lovingness is that I gave him chance after chance after chance and now I'm chastising him. Why? Because I want to crush him. Oh, no, because I want to see him grow. I want to see him become better. I think of Hebrews where we're taught the Lord disciplines those he loves discipline correction chastisement is all in love so sometimes the, the 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 speaking the truth in love doesn't always come across super tender does it sometimes it comes across kind of firm sometimes it comes across with hey you know why it ain't working out why because you've been you've been married to five different husbands and none of them are making you happy you know why because they'll never make you happy only one can make you happy you want this that and the other from the government do you know why it ain't working out because they can't satisfy you want every single law that you want in place and you think it's going to work, it's not going to work. Do you know why? Because only Jesus can satisfy. You think those drugs, that activity, that person, you think this item, this money, this thing, that and the other will do it. It will never do it. They can never satisfy. Because what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his very soul unto those things ultimately? Gain the world. Gain notoriety. Gain the money gain uh, love from earthly people, credit from earthly people, get it all. But if you have not Christ, you have nothing. And the beauty is, the flip is this, is if you have Christ, you have everything. And so sometimes that firm truth has to come in and it's gotta be an elbow to your face. Sensitive people, sometimes you just gotta get over yourself and say, I know this was hard to hear, I know this hurt me a little bit, but it's like going to the dentist, it hurts now but it'll fix things. In two, in two weeks, I'll never, the pain will be gone and things will be better. It's like surgery. They had to cut open my leg. They had to chisel away at some, some bad tissue and that junk hurt for a couple of weeks. But now I'm already seeing myself get back to normal. So thick skinned people, my challenge to you is speak more tenderly. Pray and ask the Holy Spirit to give you discernment as to when to speak or when to be quiet when to chastise and when to gently and lovingly pull close and say, I'm with you no matter what. Because in the midst of all this thick skin people, we remember these beautiful empathetic words is that we have a high priest who identifies with us. He knows what it is to be tempted in every way. And yet, praise God, it reminds us though, was without sin. But he knows what I'm going through. He knows what you're going through. And rather than always throw elbows and hit you hard and say, stop that knucklehead, he goes, hey, hey, do you know why you shouldn't do this? And he does it in a way that shows love. And sensitive people, just remember, Christ is for you. But that does not mean Christ is gonna hem and haw and, um, um, let me tell you why you shouldn't do this. No, sometimes he's gonna be very tough on you. And I will tell you that for me in my life, some of the best moments of my life have been the hard chastisement of the Lord. Not just gentle redirecting, but the bop on the head has been a big difference for me. And that's a personal experience that I can tell you many people agree with and identify with. But no matter what we do to build unity, to build, to, to grow up into the, to the head and, and to grow up and to be more like Christ, to be more like the church that he wants us to be, we have to speak the truth in love. Love comes in many forms, firm, gentle, and truth. Firm, gentle, and truth, all three of those. So I wanna challenge you today, no matter which side of the scale you tip towards, to speak the truth in love, to accept the truth in love, and by God, let's just be the church. And let's stop tearing each other down for stuff that really isn't absolute. There's one that is. There's one truth that's absolute. 
And that's the gospel. God bless you.